Placing his bag on the back seat, James took the umbrella in his right hand, opened it above himself and the elderly woman. He liked the rain if it came no more than once a month. However, the roads hadn't dried up for the past week, and the sidewalks had turned into muddy streams flowing into small country houses. Today, he paid no attention to the rain only because his mind was focused on his mother, whom he would have to say goodbye to for several months until his next vacation. Well, then, have a safe trip, Darcy said. She was a 65-year-old woman who looked quite young for her age. Goodbye, Mom, James replied softly. Don't forget about me. Call me if you have a moment. Come back soon, and preferably not alone. Many of my friends already have grandchildren, and you're still fussing around with your work day and night instead of. That's enough, Mom, I get it, James interrupted. You know what times are like now. To start a family, you need a starting capital no less than to start a small business. What's there to love when your pockets are empty? Business, money, capital, Darcy enumerated with a touch of disdain. Don't get me wrong, James. I'm not saying that at your age your father and I never thought about money. We did, and quite a lot. But please, never put the word money in the same sentence as the word love. Okay, Mom, we've been discussing this for almost a whole week now. And now it's time for me to go, otherwise I'll be driving until morning. And the weather is not the safest. Go on, go on, my little businessman. Darcy said with a smile. They hugged goodbye, James handed over the umbrella got behind the wheel, and turned on the windshield wipers. He had a three-hour drive ahead of him to the city. He had been driving for about an hour and a half, contemplating the conversation with his mother. He had never taken such conversations to heart before, but with each passing year, they became more and more painful. James liked solitude as much as he liked rain. Being alone for a month or two was quite all right, but when it lasted for years, it started to cause concern. Driving along the muddy winding road near the forest was no less unsettling. James's only desire was to get to the highway as soon as possible and then to the city. Stop. Stop. A child's voice was heard, and then a small silhouette appeared right in the middle of the road. The car stopped, and James rushed outside. What are you doing here, little one? He asked. Mama. Mama is in the forest. And Uncle Carl. He, he. The little girl sobbed. She was scared and completely soaked. It was unclear how long she had been standing there, but on her small face, it was hard to distinguish tears from raindrops. Let's get in the car. You'll calm down, and then you'll tell me everything, James said calmly and seated the girl in the passenger seat. Then he squatted down and prepared to listen. Uncle Carl kidnapped us, the girl said. He offered to give us a ride home. Mom refused, but he grabbed me and locked me in the car. And then he, he. Calm down, calm down, James tried to soothe her. What happened next? He hit mom, dragged her into the car, and we drove off. You said Uncle Carl did this? James asked. Do you know him? Are you related or just acquaintances? This uncle has been talking to mom a lot lately, but he's not related to us. I thought he was just mom's friend. I have friends at kindergarten, so I thought she also got a friend. The girl wiped her tears with her sleeve, which, judging by the mud, had left a mark on her cheek. And how did you end up here in the middle of the road? James asked, taking a pack of napkins from the glove compartment. When this uncle stopped the car, there were only trees around. He pulled mom out of the car, started hitting her. He forgot to lock the car door, and I ran away. He didn't even notice. I, 
I shouldn't have left mom. The girl cried again. Calm down. You did everything right, James said, wiping the girl's tears with a napkin. What's your name? James asked. Lena, the girl replied. Nice to meet you, Lena. I'm James. James said. Lena, let's sit in the car for a few minutes, and I'll go into the forest and try to find your mom. Okay? All right, Lena replied after a moment's thought. Just don't worry. Here, take these napkins. I'll lock the car. You'll be safe, James reassured her. He found a small flashlight in the glove compartment, looked at his new acquaintance with interest, and then locked the car door with the key. Here's an adventure for you, the man thought, peering into the depths of the forest. After taking a few steps, he glanced back at the girl. She was sitting still, watching him from the window. She wasn't crying anymore and didn't look as scared as she did in the first few minutes of their meeting. James quickened his pace and within a few minutes found himself surrounded by trees from all sides. For about 20 minutes, he walked in the direction from which the girl had run. James was excited. After all, it's not every day you walk alone in the middle of the forest. But not searching for the woman would be an even greater crime. Why? What for? Who could do such a thing? James pondered, carefully surveying the area. Then he saw a small butterfly-shaped brooch on the ground. Perhaps Lena dropped it when she ran away, he thought, putting the ornament in his back pocket. Near where the brooch lay were traces of someone's shoes. The footprint was large, definitely not Lena's. But it's unlikely it belonged to the bandit either, James thought. And how else would you call him if not a bandit, he repeated and continued to explore the area. The footprint was definitely from women's shoes, as it showed the imprint of a heel. Following this track for several meters, James came across a body. It was a woman unconscious. James was taken aback and froze for a few seconds. Meanwhile, sitting in the car, Lena carefully inspected the interior. Sometimes she looked out the window, waiting for her new acquaintance. I hope he finds mom, the girl thought. She was very worried but wasn't crying anymore. However, she was deeply saddened when she discovered her beloved brooch, given to her by her late great-grandfather, was missing. Suddenly, looking out the window, she saw a silhouette. It was James. He was carrying a woman in a red dress. Lena understood everything immediately. That's mom. That's mom, she shouted. James opened the door, laid the woman on the back seat, and quickly got behind the wheel. Mom. Mom, the girl kept shouting, hoping for a response. Mom fell asleep for a little while, James said, trying not to worry the girl. We need to take her to the hospital, and they'll wake her up there. Just don't worry. Where did you find her? What did he do to her? Lena asked. She was in the forest. I don't know who did this, James said with a frown. But he won't be free for long. What do you mean you won't be free for long? Lena asked in surprise. To roam freely, James calmly replied, then started the car, and they headed towards the hospital. It was around one in the morning when James arrived at the nearest medical center. The hospital looked very gloomy, with half of the lights turned off. Lena immediately felt uneasy in such an environment. The nurses on duty that night quickly loaded the woman onto a stretcher and took her to a ward where the attending doctor probably started providing medical assistance. After some time, the doctor came out of the ward. He looked at James, at Lena, who seemed ready to fall asleep. What's your name, young man? The doctor asked. James. Great. I need to talk to you face to face, the doctor said. No problem, James replied and followed the doctor. 
After a few meters, they stopped at the duty room, and the doctor asked, Are you familiar with this woman? No. I met her daughter in the forest, and then I found her, James replied nervously. You know, the doctor began to explain, this woman spent quite a bit of time unconscious, apparently from pain or shock. We also found bruises and signs of blows on her body. We brought her to her senses with the team, but we can't do without the police. So, we've called a detective. He'll come tomorrow because she's not in a condition to give testimony yet. The doctor adjusted his glasses and took out a pen. I understand. Do you need anything else from me? James asked. I'm not authorized to detain you, but the investigation will likely have some questions for you. So, please write down your contact information, and I'll pass it on to the police, the doctor replied. All right, no problem, said James, then took a pen from the doctor and wrote down his details on a piece of paper. I apologize, James added, but what about the girl? Is she her daughter? Will she wait in the corridor all night? You're right, the doctor said, but here's the problem. With your arrival, we're completely out of free beds. There are a couple of spots in the infectious diseases department, but healthy people are strictly forbidden there. The only thing I can offer her is to spend the night in our duty room. The girl was sitting on a bench a few meters away from James and the doctor, but she had good hearing and, upon hearing this, immediately jumped up and ran to them. No, no. I don't want to stay in the hospital. I hate hospitals. Lena shouted, forgetting about the time of day and the need for quiet. It's dark and smells bad here. It's worse than in the forest, she cried. Hush, James tried to calm her down, squatting down. Well, what do you suggest? We don't know your relatives' contacts or how to reach them. I suggest you drive me around in the car until mom wakes up completely. And then you'll take us home. Lena exclaimed. What a resourceful girl, the doctor said with a smile. And now, please excuse me, I have to go. The shift isn't over yet, the doctor said and walked away down the hospital corridor. Listen, Lena, I have an idea, James said. Are you okay with riding a little more in the car? Of course, I am. Lena said happily, and they headed towards the exit from the disliked place. And then they drove back along the same road they had taken to the hospital, only in a different direction. Are we going back? Are we going to that forest? Lena asked anxiously. No, don't worry. We're going to the dacha, where my mom lives. I'll ask her to look after you for a while, James said, turning onto the road leading to their dacha. Mama will be delighted. James thought, then parked near the fence. They didn't have to wait long. Darcy rushed out of the house after the second doorbell. James? Why are you so late? Forgot something, said the unknown woman to Lena with surprise. No, Mom, I didn't forget anything. This girl's name is Lena, and she got into an unpleasant situation. Let's go into the house, and I'll tell you everything in detail, James said. Son, I was teasing you about grandchildren, but I didn't think you'd start acting so quickly, Darcy joked on the way to the house. Mama, it's actually a serious situation. We're not very receptive to humor right now. Let's put the child to bed, and then I'll tell you everything in detail, James said, leading Lena into the bedroom. After Lena fell asleep, James told his mother everything. Darcy was very agitated, to say the least. Mom, I understand that this situation is like a snowball, but can you sit with Lena for a while? Until her mom wakes up completely? James asked. Of course, sweetheart, Darcy agreed. Thank you, mom. I don't think it will take long. 
And now I'll go home. It's already three in the morning. I want to get some sleep, James said goodbye and went to his car. But he could hardly sleep. When he got home, James wandered from room to room, recalling fragments of today's events. Who's the guy who took them to the forest, he thought, tossing and turning in bed from insomnia. Who's capable of such brutality? For what? Such thoughts plagued him almost until morning. I need to go to the hospital tomorrow and try to talk to that woman, he thought. Lord, I didn't even learn her name. I must go. Especially since the police will probably have questions. I just hope not to become a suspect. At seven in the morning, James got out of bed. He still wasn't sure if he had managed to sleep at all. It was sunny outside. Has the rain finally stopped? James thought. Anyway, I prefer the sun. He drank his coffee, grabbed his phone, and dialed someone's number. Hello, Alex? Hey, he said sleepily into the receiver. Listen, I want to extend my vacation for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. We'll settle it. All right. Let's do it. The call was with his business colleague. They owned their own network of restaurants in the city, so arranging a couple of days off was no problem. James finished his coffee, got dressed, and then headed to the hospital to visit his new acquaintance. The hospital didn't seem as gloomy in the morning. Now the corridor was lit by sunlight rather than eerie night lamps. The only thing that remained unchanged was the smell. James approached the familiar nurse. Hello, yesterday I brought a girl here with injuries, unconscious. Can I talk to her? He asked. Yes, yes, I remember you. She's with an investigator now. It seems he wanted to talk to you too. So, wait in the corridor, the nurse replied, handing James some shoe covers. Putting on the shoe covers, James approached the ward where the woman lay and sat on a bench by the door. The door was slightly ajar, and snippets of the woman's phrases could be heard from inside. No, no, officer. We didn't know the person who did it, she said. We just hitchhiked, and he drove us into the woods. And then, I don't remember. A few minutes later, the investigator came out of the room and approached James. He asked him a few questions, then asked him to sign a non-departure agreement for the duration of the investigation. After the interview, James knocked on the door of the ward. Come in, a female voice was heard. James entered and, after a brief look around, sat on a chair next to the woman. The room was quiet, with only the sounds of rustling leaves from the open window. The woman lay on her back, covered with a white blanket. Next to her was an four drip and an empty bedside table. Looking at this table, James remembered that in the morning he had thought of stopping by the store and buying some fruits as a gesture of kindness. But in the rush, it completely slipped his mind. Hello, my name is James, he said. Nice to meet you. I'm Evelina, the woman said. The doctor already told me that some man brought me here. And judging by the description, it's you. Hmm, interesting. How did the doctor describe me? James said with a smile. Yes, I found your daughter near the woods, and then found you. Oh, Lena. My goodness. I hope she's okay? Evelina asked anxiously. Don't worry, she's fine. I took her to her mother. She's completely safe, James tried to reassure her. Oh, thank God. I hope they won't keep me here for long. Evelina sat up, then asked James for some water. Of course, of course, James said, approaching the water cooler. Sorry, I overheard your conversation with the investigator. Maybe it's not my business, but why did you lie to him? He handed Evelina a glass of water. 
She took a few sips and looked uncertainly at James. I'm not sure I want to involve strangers in my problems, she said. This situation has been going on for more than a day, and the police refused to help me at the time. So I don't see the point in pulling them away from their work again, Evelina said, quoting, apparently, one of the police officers. I understand you, Evelina, but... Let's switch to you, she interrupted. Okay, Evelina. Just understand, if you make a secret out of all this, it may happen again. And it's not guaranteed to end as well. Right now, you and your daughter are safe, but that monster, sorry, is still out there, exclaimed James. Well, okay. You didn't just pass by my daughter, you saved me. I'll tell you, but I don't know what it will change, Evelina put the empty glass on the table and began her story. This dark streak started about a year ago. It all started with the death of my grandfather. We were very close because he raised me since I was 15. We lived together since my mother died. I was 15 then. I never saw my father, so my grandfather was the only close person to me, Evelina recounted. Wait a minute, you have a daughter. Where's your husband? James asked. He went abroad when Lena was a year old. Since then, there's been no sign of him. But never mind him. He has nothing to do with this story, Evelina said, clearly not wanting to talk about her ex-husband. All right. But who's this guy who kidnapped you? How is he connected to your grandfather? James asked. This guy's name is Carl. He's not so much connected to my grandfather as he is to what I inherited from him, Evelina replied. You see, my grandfather was a well-known antique dealer. He collected all sorts of medieval jewelry. And so, to get hold of these jewels, this Carl started courting me. Well, here we go again, love and money in one sentence, James remarked. What do you mean? Evelina asked. Just recalling the words of a wise woman, James remembered, then asked Evelina to continue her story. Besides inheriting my grandfather's antique treasures, I also inherited a large three-bedroom apartment in the city center and a two-story country house. I don't know how this guy knows all this, but when he met me, he was only interested in my inheritance, Evelina recounted. It's a pity I didn't realize it right away. I found him unpleasant from the start. Why? James asked. He was very persistent, obsessed. At first, I thought it was with me, but then I realized it was only with my money, Evelina replied. And how did you figure that out? James inquired. After many attempts to court me, this guy named Carl, God knows if that's his real name, in short, he told me straight out that I had to become his wife. Of course, I took it as nonsense, after which he started threatening me and my daughter. Scared, I ran to the police, but they didn't take my word seriously. They accepted the statement, of course, but the next day, they probably forgot about it, Evelina said. Evelina looked out the window. I want to see my daughter as soon as possible. We need to leave the city. I feel like this guy will never leave us alone, Evelina said. Don't rush, Evelina. I'm sure we can find and put him behind bars. Tell me this, are yesterday's events the result of him moving from words to actions? James asked. When we arrived in the woods, he threw me out of the car, hit me several times, and said he wouldn't give me my daughter back until I agreed to his terms. He said I wouldn't see Lena until I agreed to share the marital bed with him, or rather, the marital property. But then he turned to the car and realized his whole plan had gone awry Lena had escaped. You can't imagine how angry he got, but I can. He put all his anger into one final blow, after which I lost consciousness, Evelina looked at James. 
I remember your, sorry, your face as you carried me to the car. I vaguely remember Lena's voice, and then I think I blacked out completely. What a monster! James exclaimed, jumping up from his chair. I promise we'll find him. You've already done so much for us, Evelina said. Don't worry, we'll leave, and he won't find us. Evelina tried to calm James down, which was quite difficult. I don't want to scare you, Evelina, but I think such a persistent creep won't stop hunting you just because you changed cities. Besides, he somehow found out about your inheritance. So, I think he has a lot of connections, James said. Yes, he warned us not to dare go to the police. He threatened that he had a lot of acquaintances there, Evelina confirmed. Well, there you go. Either he goes to jail, or you'll live in constant fear. So, there's no choice, we have to find him. But how will you do that? Evelina asked. You know, people love two things, eating and gossiping. And I happen to have a business in that area. In the gossip area? Evelina asked with a smile. No, I have a chain of restaurants. James laughed. I think we can find out something about your suitor. By the way, do you have his photograph? I think I do. After his latest harassment, before going to the police, I took a photo of him secretly, just in case. Maybe not of the best quality, but still. I can send it to you by email if you give me your contact details. Okay, James handed Evelyn his business card, and soon they parted ways. On the way home from the hospital, James thought that his business colleague might be able to help in the search, as he had previously been a police officer. Perhaps he still has some detective skills, he thought ironically. But the most important thing that remains after serving in the police force is, of course, not skills, but connections. Connections with the world of justice. And, of course, with the criminal world. James met with his colleague a few hours later at one of his restaurants. He described the situation in detail and asked for help. Why is this woman so important to you? Alex asked, not understanding his colleague's deep interest. Why not help people? James asked. Think about it. Even if they move to another city, they still risk falling into the hands of this jerk. So, just ordinary compassion? Altruism, his colleague asked again. But it seems to me you're not indifferent to this woman, he added with a smirk. Well, that's none of your concern. Will you help or not? Of course. What wouldn't one do to make their business partner happier, Alex replied ironically. If I dig up anything, I'll call you. And now, go get some rest, you look exhausted. They said their goodbyes. James went home, where he could finally get some sleep. The doctor informed Evelyn that she would be discharged in a couple of days, and it seemed Lena had found common ground with Darcy. Over the next couple of days, while James awaited news from his colleague, he visited Evelyn several times. They found common topics to talk about. The only thing that hindered their communication was the frequent visits of the doctor, constantly reminding Evelyn of the silence and rest she needed for quality rehabilitation. On another day, when James was about to go to the hospital, the phone rang. It was Alex. He suggested they meet because he had good news. They met at the same restaurant as a few days ago. They ordered coffee, and then Alex handed James a small piece of paper. It said, Vernatsky Prospect, Building 3, Apartment 22, 1800. What's this? James asked. It's the time and place where Carl will be waiting for you today. The one you asked me to find. You can report this to the police, but as far as I understand, you wouldn't mind having a chat with him yourself? Alex replied. But wait, how did you find him? 
and especially set up a meeting? James asked in surprise. Through personal channels, let's put it that way. But it wasn't as difficult as I thought. Alex smiled. Imagine, this guy turned out to be a dealer of antique jewelry. When you told me about Evelyn's grandfather, I decided to delve into this area. So, I found this guy. By the way, he's quite popular in their business and doesn't even try to hide, Alex explained. Great. And how did you arrange the meeting? James asked. It's simple. I contacted him through a mutual junk dealer acquaintance. He passed on to him that we could sell some precious junk. That's it. Do you want me to come with you? Alex asked. No, I think it's unnecessary, James replied, hiding the paper in his pocket. Thank you very much for your help. James thanked Alex, then began to prepare for the meeting with Carl. When he got home, he found an old knuckle duster he hadn't used in a decade. He didn't know if he would use it today, but just in case, he put it in his pocket. In the evening, he approached the designated place. Climbing the stairs leading to the apartment, James pondered his actions. Maybe I should have asked for help from the police after all, he thought. But it was too late, and such agitation could not help. James remembered Lena crying, Evelyn being beaten in his arms. And by the time he reached the door, the excitement was gone. There was only a desire to punish the offender. James knocked on the door. A few seconds later, a man opened it. He had long white hair, just like in the photo. Carl? James asked. Carl. And you, the man didn't finish his sentence. He found himself on the floor from a strong blow. James closed the apartment door, then restrained the man's hands. He led him into the room and made him sit on a chair. Well, Carl, start talking, James said, then turned on the voice recorder on his phone. Alex had advised him to turn on the recorder when he learned that James wasn't planning to involve the police. Tell me everything in order. Who are you, anyway, damn it? Carl asked. I'm a very good friend of a woman named Evelyn and her daughter. Do you know them? James asked sternly. After that, Carl laughed. Do you find something funny in this situation? James continued. Do you understand what you've done? You could have killed that woman. You beat her, for God's sake. You scared the child to death. And now you're laughing? For what? For money? Or maybe for the country house apartment? Isn't your jump bringing in enough profit, so you decided to forcibly take what's not yours? James couldn't control his emotions and was already shouting. Yes, they're to blame themselves. Carl shouted back. I wanted to do it the easy way, persuaded her, complimented her, gave her flowers. Uh-huh. And when compliments didn't work, you decided to try fists. Am I understanding correctly? James asked. Listen, to hell with all of you. Everything would have been fine if she had agreed to the beneficial exchange I offered her, Carl said. What exchange? You wanted to become her husband and take away all her property. And then, you would have dumped her, James said, frowning. Yeah, where do you get off thinking I would have dumped her? Carl yelled angrily. I would have continued to shower her with my love in exchange for money and her grandfather's collection, which is highly valued in our circles. Never put the word money in the same sentence as love. James said calmly, then called the police. While they waited for the police, Carl continued to hurl insults, which no longer bothered James at all. He just wanted to finish this story as soon as possible. Half an hour later, the police arrested Carl, and the investigator received the recording with Carl's confessions. 
Evelyn was discharged a week later, and James came to pick her up from the hospital. Well, shall we go downstairs? He asked her after telling her the story of Carl's arrest. I can't believe you went to meet him yourself, she said. You risked your life. This guy is clearly crazy. But it all ended well, James replied calmly. Let's go. They said goodbye to the doctor and went by car to pick up Lena, who was eagerly waiting for her mom at Darcy's. James parked near the Dacha fence and was about to get out of the car. Wait! Evelyn suddenly looked sharply at James and took his hand. What's wrong? he asked timidly. I want to thank you. You know, it feels like a weight has been lifted off my chest. I can't believe I'll be able to walk around the city without constantly looking around. Thank you so much, she said. I did what I had to, James replied calmly. By the way, about walks. Walking around the city is useful, of course, but what about walks by the river and fresh forest air? I think after what you've been through, you need rest. And it's hard to find it in the city. I wouldn't mind that, Evelyn replied, if only you keep me company. She smiled, closed her eyes, and squeezed James's hand even tighter. Of course, I'll keep you company, James said, then kissed her. Meanwhile, a small silhouette appeared outside the car window, which neither James nor Evelyn noticed. Lena was looking at her mom and smiling. Later, Darcy appeared next to her, also smiling at his son. When James and Evelyn noticed the spectators outside the car window, they felt a little embarrassed. But this awkwardness soon passed, as Evelyn was very happy to see her daughter. And Lena was happy to see her healthy and happy mom. Darcy set a large table, around which James recounted the details of this detective story. Lena listened with the utmost attention, and afterwards added, It's a very interesting story. It's good that it ended this way. It's just a pity that I lost my favorite brooch, Lena looked at her mom. I'm sorry, Mom, I know it's a very expensive item that Grandpa left behind, but it got lost somewhere. Probably in the forest when I ran away. At that moment, James remembered the butterfly brooch he found while looking for Evelyn. He took it out of his pocket and placed it on the table. Are you talking about this brooch by any chance? James asked. Yes, yes. That's it. Lena exclaimed with joy. She ran up to James and hugged him tightly, expressing her gratitude. After spending several months relaxing at the dacha, Evelyn grew very close to James, and he decided to propose to her. Lena and Darcy were thrilled. Of course, Evelyn agreed. Meanwhile, Carl received a five-year sentence in a medium-security penal colony for threats, kidnapping, and assault causing grievous bodily harm. When his sentence ends, he is unlikely to want to pursue Evelyn's inheritance again, as she will already have several legitimate heirs. And Darcy will have several long-awaited grandchildren.